Okay, just a quick review because we have test tomorrow. That's right, isn't it? Okay, well, I'm gonna make sure we are on the same page, Jonathan. So the test will be over chapters 25, 26, and 27. Chapter 25 was our introduction to light. Now, I remember from 24, we had things like light is electromagnetic wave, setting that up. Okay. And so in five, we looked at the ray nature of light. That is, light travels in straight lines. And so we learned about first reflections. Make sure you know the difference between specular or mirror-like reflection and diffuse reflection, reflections that occur excuse me, off of rough surfaces, giving you a spread of the light. Diffusers spread out the light. Yes, the hiccups, sorry. Then we had refraction. Refraction is the bending of light when it goes from a material with one light speed to another light speed. And so make sure that you remember Snell's law and can use Snell's law relating the index of refraction, n is equal to, well, it's defined as the speed of light in vacuum C over the speed of light in whatever the material is, that you can relate that index refraction to the change in angle of the light when you go from one material to another. You will, I am sure, have a problem where you just have a simple interface and light comes in at one angle, goes out at another angle. Those are perfect straight lines. Goes out another angle. Where do you measure the angles from if you're gonna be doing a refraction problem? From the surface normal. Not from the surface, but from the surface normal. So the surface normal is the line that is perpendicular to what you draw on your paper for the surface. Question, Eric. Um, so on the home further review assignment, there was a problem that had to do with two mirrors being set um, at 127 of each other. And it was dealing with the law of reflections. Mm -hmm. Um, the thetas that it gave us were not based on the normal to the surface. They're just based on the mirror. So with reflection problems, is there a possibility that the angle you give us will just be the angle from the light to the mirror surface? With, with a reflection or refraction, that's a possibility. Okay. You have to make sure you translate it into the correct angle. But it'll now, state it clearly, like which angle? It, it'll say either between the surface and the light. If it says between the surface and the light, then it's not the right angle. It's if it says between the surface normal and the light, then it's the right angle. It's the correct angle. <laughs> Be careful on right versus correct here. Um, with the reflections, remember we had the law of reflections. Where's, I didn't write down. The law of reflections right there. There it is. The law of reflections, because it's just angle one equals angle two, it technically doesn't matter which one you use. But when you're doing the refraction because it's n1 sine theta 1 equals n2 sine theta 2, it makes a world of difference. So by default, we define our angles as the angle between the normal and the instant for both reflection and refraction, so we don't have to have two different ways. Okay, then we had mirrors, lenses, and the images they form. So make sure you know the relationship between the radius of curvature of a mirror and its focal length. Know that by the definition, parallel incident rays on a lens or a mirror will converge at a single point that we call the focal point. That's the definition of the focal point, where parallel incident rays converge. If the rays really meet, then we have a real focal point with a positive focal length. If the rays move away from each other, then we have to extrapolate back to a virtual point that it looks like they would have met and then they diverge from. In that case, it's a negative focal length. It's a diverging type of lens or mirror. So make sure you understand those. And remember, light works the same forward and backward. So when we do our ray tracing, you will have to do a ray tracing diagram. So if you have your own ruler, bring it. Otherwise, you know, we do have these here that there will be plenty for you to use but if you have your own then you don't have to share and you can have it when you're ready um, so 
the parallel ray and the focal ray are just the reverse of each other. Parallel ray, it comes in parallel, comes out as, as if it came from a focal point. Focal ray goes through the focal point, comes out parallel. If you want any more detail on the ray tracing, go ahead and look at those tutorials that I made that are on, on YouTube for how to do each of the possible, I think it's four different types of drawings you might have to do. So make sure you look over those if you're not sure. Because on the problem, and I, I tell students this, and, and of course, often there are students who don't believe me, you're given something like an object is 32 centimeters from a 20 centimeter focal length mirror. Find the image position using ray tracing. Oftentimes, I will have people who find the image position using the thin lens equation, which is a perfectly good way to test, to check your answer, but then they don't have the rays necessary to construct that image. They'll have seemingly random rays drawn. And so you need to make sure that you have, if it's a lens, it has to be the parallel ray, the focal ray, and the vertex rays. If it's a mirror, you have to have three of the four, those three plus the center ray. The center ray is the one that goes through the center of curvature, which is you know, one radius away, and goes straight out and straight back. So you have three of those four if it's a mirror. But you have to have those rays. I'm going to be grading on, does the person have each of the three independent rays? Is each one drawn correctly? That's what I'm going to be looking for in the grading. Right? They, if they're drawn correctly, you should have the right distance. But if you just say, here it is, I did it with the thin lens equation, that's not what I'm looking for because I want to make sure you understand how the ray tracing works. Right? Because ain't nobody wants to write tests and have students do poorly on it. Just a waste of my time. All right. Next, chapter 26. Chapter 26, we did not talk about cameras. We talked about the eye, about microscopes, and about telescopes. So for the eye, now I'm not going to ask you a lot of questions about biology here. So don't say, well, I'm going to know all the biology of the eye. That's not really beneficial. But you should know that you have you know, three types of cones, one that's most sensitive in the red range, one that has its peak sensitivity at green. Notice I used slightly different words there. One that has its peak, peak sensitivity at blue, and thus we have red, green, and blue as our primary colors of light. And that the rods just give us you know, broad range vision. And then what does the cornea do? What's the primary purpose of the cornea? It's doing the, the focusing. It's doing the majority of the focusing. Let's skip over to the lens then. What is the lens doing if the cornea is doing the primary focusing? It's doing a little bit of extra focusing to allow us to accommodate, which means to allow us to focus on different distances. The cornea in the ideal eye allows us to focus on something infinitely far away. The lens allows us to also focus on things that are closer. In between those two, we have the iris. What was the purpose of the iris? It controls how much light we get in. And it gives you your beautiful eye color, whatever it happens to be. So the iris is something that our brain controls to adjust how much light gets in. The retina, that's where we have the rods and cones where the image is formed. And so your optical system should be making a real image on the retina. We had four types of vision problems that are geometry based that we can deal with in a physics type um, of setting. You have myopia. Myopia when the eyeball is too long or the cornea is too flat. And then you have, um, wait, did I say that right? Too curved, yes, too curved. I knew what, that didn't feel right. 
this. <clears throat> also, myopia is called nearsightedness because you can focus on near things just fine. A nearsighted person can focus pretty close to their eyeball, but they can't focus on far things. Hyperopia is the opposite. Either the eyeball is too short or the um, cornea is too flat. And so in that case, you can focus on far things fine, but you can't focus on near things. And actually, in theory, a person that has hyperopia could focus on something that's behind them. If, you know, if the rays are diverging by a little amount, they could actually still focus on it. Um, so those are the two most primary things. I say most primary. Only one of them is most common, and that is the nearsightedness, the myopia. Then we have astigmatism, that is a non-spherically symmetric cornea. All of us, to some degree, probably have non-perfect symmetry to the cornea. If it's too bad, well, then you have lenses to correct it, so you have light focusing the same place, whether it's looking at something that has vertical dimension or horizontal dimension. And finally, the presbyopia. What does presbyopia mean? Old per person vision. That occurs because the crystalline lens there has hardened, so it can't accommodate as much, so it starts moving out the closest place you can focus on. You should know something I didn't write here. The ideal, E-A-L, near point is equal to, and the ideal far point is equal to. What should those values be? 25 centimeters for the near point and in fame for the far point. Now, those are ideal. What's ideal about 25 centimeters? That's based on an average. Right? There is no true ideal for the near point. But for a person that has what we consider standard vision, 25 centimeters is their near point. Right? Ideally, you'd be able to see from here to infinity. Right? So calling it the ideal is probably not the best name, but it's what we use. So when you're doing correction with um, eyeglasses, you're going to take an object that is, if you're far-sighted, you can see far just fine, you're correcting the near point. So you're going to take an object that's at the ideal near point and have it create an image at your actual near point. If you're correcting for near-sighted, they can see near just fine, so you take an object at the ideal far point, it's infinitely far away, and make an image at the actual far point. And if you have presbyopia, well, you have one of each. Because with presbyopia, if you are, and it's possible to have both myopia and presbyopia, then you can't see near and you can't see far. And so you have one lens that corrects the far vision, one lens that corrects the near vision. Then we had microscopes and telescopes. Oh, and I forgot to write simple magnifiers. Put that up here. Simple magnifier. Er. Chronologically, you have to talk about the simple magnifier first because the simple magnifier is something that allows us to take an object and make the angle it makes in our eye bigger. And so we learned about the magnification you get from a simple magnifier. And then we said the microscope is going to take a simple magnifier plus an objective lens. And that objective lens is going to give a transverse magnification to a small object that's placed close to it. And then we work through the equations for how the magnification depends on the separation between the two lenses and the focal lengths of the two lenses. And I pointed out that although the equation says the magnification doesn't matter which lens is the objective and which one's the eyepiece, in practice it makes a world of difference because that magnification also depends on the separation. And the separation is going to depend on which one you have as the objective. And so you need to have the short focal length lens as the objective for a microscope. Now for a telescope, you have the opposite, well not the opposite, but a different goal. A telescope, you want to see a far object. And so you have an objective that takes a very far object and makes a real image. And then the eyepiece is focusing on that image. So you once again have the objective is giving you an image that you're looking at the focal length once again it's very, or the magnification, just a simple ratio of the focal lengths. And you want to have the objective being the long focal length lens if it's a telescope. If you reverse them, well, you have something that makes things smaller instead of bigger, and that's not a benefit to us. 
So make sure you understand about those. Then refractors are made with lenses. That is the objective is a lens. And reflectors are made with mirrors. And once again, the objective. The eyepiece is pretty much always a lens. So if it has an objective that's a mirror, it's a reflector. So make sure you can identify the differences and, and work with either one. All the equations are the same. Just so make sure you understand them. Finally, chapter 27. Chapter 27, we were specifically looking at the wave nature of light. Now, today, according to the original schedule today, I was starting in on um, chapter 29, which is looking at the particle nature of light. So starting with our lecture after the exam, we'll start looking at the particle nature of light, a distinctly different nature of light. Um, so the wave nature is light behaving as a wave. And I gave you a little preface about that, that Newton had believed that light was a particle, but then Thomas Young showed very distinctly with his double slit interference that light had to be a wave. And so diffraction, the bending of light around an obstruction, I don't have the word written here because I went quickly. Make sure you understand interference, the conditions for constructive interference and destructive interference. You should be able to develop an equation for constructive or destructive interference on reflection from a thin film. And remember, there's not a general equation for it. There are two different equations you can get, but four different scenarios to get those. So you need to be able to develop them you know, to identify which situation applies here. Um, so like if you just pull out, oh, here's the equation, I'd be like, well, where did it come from? And, you know, how, what's the reasoning for it? So make sure that you can do that with the thin film problems. And then for physics 152 students, you only need to know about double slit or diffraction grading interference. You don't need to know single slit. For physics 252 students, we did the calculus derivation for the um, single slit. So obviously they have to know about the single slit. That's one of the options for your calculus-based problem. So make sure you understand, you know, how the maxima occur, how to use that equation for both the maxima or the minima. Question? Um, so I'm wondering about an oil, there's like a problem with an oil drop on top mm -hmm. of water. Yeah, it's a microscope and that's changing the numerical aperture for, mm -hmm. yeah. But I'm specifically talking about um, like, if the path length is less than uh, lambda over four, then it's going to be dark for that wavelength of light or for like, so you're trying to find out what the maximum width of the oil drop is for all of the visible light to be um, dark. And so the, the way that you have to do it okay. is like... It's not the problem I was thinking then. Yeah. That's, that's okay, oh, so but, um, the way that you have to do it, the equation that they use is that the path length difference is 2TN. But I'm wondering how many inversions of um, phase, or how many different phase differences there are for well, that. So we have... Down here is glass, right? It's is is that what's no? It's air to oil to water. Oh, water. Okay. Mm -hmm. I don't know offhand what the. Okay, so I have the indices of refraction of each one here. So then if I take my light, I would have two rays that I need to worry about. So I'm going to have right? And so I'm going to look at the path differences between the two as well as phase inversions. Those are the two things I have to look at. So if I do this for the first one, I have a reflection off of a higher index refraction. Higher index refraction, slower speed, it's going to have, uh, I'm going to use it in, remember I talked about you can do it in angle or in path length. 
And so I'm going to do it in terms of the path length. And so that would be a one half wavelength difference because of the phase inversion. Now the second one, it's going oil off of water. There is no phase inversion there. So I would have two times the thickness times the index refraction of oil plus zero. Right. Okay. And then was it, it was destructive? Yeah, it was for destructive. Okay, so that equals. Less than and so now, well, the last part of the problem, because it said for all light to be, all visible light to be. For the wavelength. The path length difference has to be less than the wavelength over four. No, no, the, the question, not the answer. It's asking us to find the minimum thickness for what? No, the maximum thickness Max, for okay. all light to be dark. Okay, for all light to be dark. It gives us that um, stipulation that the path length is less than like the four for it to be So that means I want to be subconstructive for all of my light, right? Because the, the destructive, it's not going to be perfectly constructive or destructive for, you know, varying thicknesses, but I want to make sure that it is, the thickness is less than what I'm going to have for my first constructive interference. And so I'm going to do it for constructive in this case. And so then I have And of course, we'll take the M as zero here, so that it's just the other one. And so it's got to be less than that, where this is going to be your shortest wavelength. Okay. Okay, continuing on, we had the circular aperture. Remember, for the circular aperture, you had the um, condition for destructive interference was... A sine theta equals 1.22 lambda for the first destructive case. And that's the only one we looked at because it's more complicated with the circular aperture. Why did we look at that? So you could look at Rayleigh's criterion to see, okay, what kind of resolution do I have with what size of objective? Finally, we had polarization. And polarization, I love to do the demonstrations because it's so cool. Remember that law of malice that says the intensity transmitted is equal to the initial intensity cosine squared of the angle between the incident polarization and the polarizer. Now I have one student that contacted me about the homework problem that dealt with this and it said you have polarizer one so you have unpolarized light, hits polarizer one, and then it hits polarizer two that's at an angle of, it would change for everybody, let's say 30 degrees with polarizer one. And then we have a third polarizer that's nine degrees with respect to polarizer one. So in that problem, yeah, don't have room here, just go back to the preceding slide. You have unpolarized light coming in this is how I indicate unpolarized light with intensity I zero. And it goes through polarizer number one, polarizer number two, hoops, well, who cares? Polarizer number three, and we want to find the intensity coming out. So I'm going to have, how do I find the intensity when it goes from unpolarized through a polarizer? <clears throat> Uh, that's a bad place to write it. Oh, 
Oops. Oh, well. Get that one back in there. So we have intensity 1 is equal to 1 half intensity 0. Now the first polarizer is just defining a direction for the polarization. The second polarizer was at, let's just say, I said 30 degrees. So what would the intensity 2 be here? I2 is equal to I1 times cosine squared of 30 degrees. And then we have the final polarizer, which has its polarizer set like that. Now I'm going to draw. There's the direction of the second polarizer. Here's the direction of the first polarizer. What's the angle for the second polarizer? It's going to be 60 degrees because that's the angle between the polarized light that hit polarizer three and polarizer three. And so then I have I made explicit where we got the 60 from. <laughs> and so we put that all together and we have I3 is equal to And that would give us our full equation. And depending on who you are, this number 30 was different for everybody. But that's how we use the law of malice. How else can light be polarized besides with the polarizer? Reflecting. Now, it's not perfectly reflected unless you're at the Brewster angle. I'm not going to ask you a question about the Brewster angle because we didn't talk about it. But at the Brewster angle, it's perfectly polarized. Any other angle, it's partially polarized. And so if I have light that's reflecting off of this surface, what direction is that partial polarization? What direction is going to be more light? Electric field is going like this. And so if I have glasses that have vertical polarization, they only allow vertical light through, it's going to block that reflection. So if you go fishing, you have water that's horizontal, you have light reflecting off of it, and you want to see the fish that are under the water, you wear vertically polarized sunglasses so that you don't see the light reflected off the surface of the water. Hence, you just see right down into the water and see the fishies. Or if you go snow skiing, once again, you have a horizontal slope, generally speaking. Light's reflecting off that horizontal slope, so you wear vertically polarized sunglasses so that the horizontal light gets blocked and you don't get the glare reflecting off the snow. Um, and then, yeah, the last thing was scattering. When we have the scattering in the atmosphere, it also causes a polarization because the direction of the electric field has to be perpendicular to the direction of propagation. And so if you have light coming this way and then it scatters and goes this way, the electric field has to be perpendicular to both of those two directions. And it's going to be perfectly polarized if they're you know, nine degrees from each other. Okay, that concludes my review portion. Jonathan. Are we going to have any problems on rainbows? On um, yes, you certainly could. I did not have that in my review here, but yes, you certainly could. Make sure you know the rainbows. You have the first order bow, one reflection. Second order bow, two reflections. And that you have the rainbows caused by different speeds of light having different refractions, right? You go back to Snell's law. So when light goes from air into water, the light that's traveling slower is bent more. The light that's traveling faster is bent less. That's what separates the colors. Yeah. Can you explain real quick why violet light moves slower than red light? No, I can't. I have studied that, but I did not prepare and I can't off the top of my head. I, I know that's not fulfilling, but it's a fact. Any other questions, questions I can answer? All right, then. Let's move into 
our addition of velocities material. And we're going to start off, I think, with a clicker question. Nope, not quite yet. So we ended last class period talking about length contraction. And I mentioned that length contraction says that when you see something moving, it's going to be shortened in the direction parallel to its velocity. So I, I left with the sage thing. If I want to look good in my rocket ship, I'm going to make sure I stand up so I have my, my head and feet makes a line that's perpendicular to the direction the rockets travel, in which case my height will stay the same because that's perpendicular to the velocity, but my width will become less and make me look like Svelte Richard. Then I turn sideways and I become, well, narrow-shouldered Richard. But it's better than having my head in the direction we're traveling, which I become short and stay in the same girth, Richard. So the rule there, only parallel velocity, not perpendicular velocity for length contraction. And the equation was the length is the <clears throat> proper length divided by gamma. Proper length is the longest possible length in any reference frame. And it's the, ref the length measured in reference frame where the object is stationary. Um, and then we had the problem solving strategies. I went through it last class period, so I won't repeat it. If you don't remember, well, you know, look at the slides. <clears throat> and let's take our clicker question here. An astronaut leaves Earth in a spacecraft moving at 0 0.80 C, travels to a star 30 light years away as measured on Earth and back. Who measures the proper trip for or proper time for this trip? Oh boy. I think that I have yeah. I have a different question here. It's proper distance is what you should be answering. What I have on my screen is the wrong question. I'll probably have the right question coming up, but it's okay. One left. There we go. Okay, so we had six, twelve, one, one. Why don't you discuss with your neighbors both the observation of proper time and proper distance? And then we'll repull it and Carrie will explain it to us all. Okay, go ahead and answer a second time. Carrie's feeling confident, right? That was a yes. Just a funny way of saying it. Okay, there we go. Okay, this time around, all the astronaut people went away, but the neither and both stayed the same. So Carrie, lay it on us. Okay, Let, let's back up to our reasoning. What sets the reference frame for the proper distance? Okay, that's going to be the reference frame where the object OB, is stationary. In this case, what's the object?
if the distance is not an actual object, but between two locations, just pretend that there is an object that's like a stick that's connecting those two locations, right? So the object is the separation between the earth and, and this planet or star. Certainly they're not landing on the star. So your object is going to be the separation between Earth and star. So in what reference frame is that separation stationary? That is, the Earth is stationary, the star is stationary, they're staying a fixed length apart from each other and not moving. The Earth's reference frame. Hence, the answer that Carrie gave us is correct. It's going to be the Earth's reference frame because that's the stationary frame for that separation. Now, what was the reference frame to give us the proper time? How do we measure the proper time? Go ahead. The reference frame that it starts and Okay, well, yes and where the clock is stationary. So that means the clock has to be at the starting point, at the midpoint, and at the end point, right? It has to be stationary to this. And so the clock in the rocket was stationary throughout because it was at the beginning point, at the ending point. It, it gets a little confusing when you think about these, which is why, once again, we're going over it. So the person in the rocket measures the proper time. But then after this discussion of the person in the rocket measuring the proper time, we have the issue of, so somebody on Earth and somebody on the spacecraft measure the times, and each person says, well, the person in the other reference frame, their clock is running slow, and so they haven't aged as much, and which one is correct? You can't both be correct. You can't come back together and you both say, yep, I knew it. You're younger than me now. So which one is actually correct? It's going to be the one made by the person on Earth because they did not accelerate. Our equations only work for non-accelerating reference frames. So the observation made by somebody on Earth, since they're not accelerating, is going to give us the right answer. The person who is accelerating can't use these equations. They have to use different equations for the times that they're accelerating. And so they're going to see, as I said at the end of the last class period, a massive aging when they take off, then very slow aging for the person on Earth, then a massive aging for the person on Earth when they change directions, slow aging, massive aging when they stop. And so that's where the, the paradox is settled, that only the person on Earth is in inertial reference frame. Only the equations we're using can only be used by them because they're the only ones in inertial reference frame. Okay. Oh, let's just do the calculation. How long is the distance as measured by the person in the rocket? We had from Jonathan's calculation that gamma was 1 over 0.6, right? Yeah, it was. So since gamma is 1 over 0.6, then this is going to be 30 light years times 1 over 1 over 0.6 equals 30 times 0.6. 18 years is the distance measured by the person in the spacecraft. And so the person in the spacecraft says, I flew a distance, uh, not years, light years, forgot the hell. I flew a distance of 
18 light years in a time of, and their time, I forgot what time we came up with them. We, we could calculate it, but I'm not going to. But it was, it was in something like in a time of, I don't know, 24 years or something like that. And it, it makes sense. They were going less than the speed of light. But if you were to have taken that, <laughs> that distance and the time measured on Earth, you would say, I measure on Earth? No, you were taking, if you put the numbers together wrong, you would get them going fast the speed of light. But it's not possible. You have to take the time and the distance in that person's reference frame. So you, you had length Earth for one way is 30 light years. Length the rocket for one way is 18 light years. The time Earth was 30 over 0.8. And the time the rocket was that time's 0. 0.6, <laughs> not 10.8. No, 37.5 times 0. 0.6. Oh, okay. So if you were to take these two numbers and combine them. You say, Ooh, that's a speed faster than the speed of light, but you can't take those because those are in different reference frames. Now to make sure we haven't lost something in all of this translation, if you have, are going back to a problem of two people in different reference frames, one of them stationary on earth, one of them is flying by and they make measurements of something like how long the spacecraft is. Who's correct? They're both correct. So the length of the spacecraft is different depending on the reference frame. The proper length is the maximum possible length it could have. So if the, if the spaceship's flying by, the person on Earth is going to measure it with a shortened length but it's still correct. It's the length in their reference frame, which leads us to a problem that if we had time, I used to love to do this. I have a, a witch riding on her broomstick that has a proper length of 75 meters. And she comes upon a barn that has a proper length of 50 meters. Now my picture doesn't do it justice because my barn looks bigger. Let's make the barn smaller. Is it possible for her to fit completely inside of that barn? Okay, Gabriel says yes, and you're correct. Under what situation can she fit inside that barn? She's got to be moving, moving really fast and, well, with respect to her, yeah. Who's got to make that measurement that she's fitting completely inside? Somebody that's in the reference frame of the barn. Somebody inside the reference frame of the barn, I usually choose a speed so that gamma is 2. So for somebody that's in the reference frame of the barn, if the gamma is 2, then her broomstick is one half the length, 37 and a half meters, and it easily fits inside. But for, for the person on the broom, what has gotten shorter? The barn. So for the person on the broom, the barn is now 25 meters long. And so the person on the broom sees one third of the broom outside this, one third of the broom in the barn, and one third of the broom outside on the other side. Doesn't come close to fitting. Once again, who's right? They're both right. How can that be that they're both right? It fits and it doesn't fit is both correct. How's that possible? 
it has to do with time is varying as well. And so if we look at the events, the event of when the front of the broom meets the back of the barn, when the back of the broom meets the front of the barn, the two observers don't agree that those are take, you know, what's simultaneous in one reference frame isn't simultaneous in the other. And so the person on the broom says, you know, you measured where the back of the broom was a long time after you measured where the front of the broom was. You got to measure at the same time. And the person on the bar says, no, no, you're the one who did it wrong. And so it's that warp in the space-time continuum, the times no longer correspond. That makes it possible. Another great question is, I have a manhole with a proper diameter of one meter, and I have a two-meter stick. That is, its proper length is two meters. It comes flying by and dropping down. Can it fit through the manhole? Yes, yes it can. Because if its horizontal velocity is fast enough, it'll be you know, less than half of the length and it, it'll fit through. And then you're like, but how is that possible? Well, in the Earth reference frame, you would see it coming like this and going, or actually no, the Earth reference frame you see coming like this, and this, the meter stick you see it going like this. Right, the, the time makes it so it looks like it's a different angle. There's a lot of other cool things you can do. Um, Gamow wrote some interesting books about what the world would be like if the speed of light was 25 meters per second. So that riding your bicycle, you're now riding at a relativistic speed and you see lengths contracted and whatnot. So, you know, if you're interested, um, I can't remember the name, but I know it's by George Gamow. He wrote a series of books to try to illustrate the ideas of, of higher level physics to children. Okay, an example of shortening. I got three minutes to get to the relativistic addition of velocities. A, a standard example of where relativity measurements can be made. Cosmic rays, you have things from the outside of our solar system come flying into our Earth's atmosphere. And so these things, mostly protons, you also have coming from the sun protons. They enter the Earth's atmosphere and they create a particle that's called a muon. The muon is, you could think of it as a heavy electron. It's a lepton like an electron. It has a negative charge like an electron. It's just a higher mass than an electron. But unlike electrons, it's not stable. It's, it decays and it has a half-life of 1.5 microseconds. That's 1.5 microseconds after it's created in its own reference frame, it will disintegrate. So if we have one of these things coming in, and if we have, um, well, if they're traveling at 0.995 C, an altitude of 4,500 meters when they are created, then we ask how many will survive? How long is it going to take to travel 4.5 kilometers at a speed of 0.995 C? I'm doing it as measured by Earth because that speed is as measured by Earth. Go ahead. Okay, distance over time. So that's going to be 4500 meters divided by 0.995 times... And between friends, we'll put 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. So what do we get from that calculation? So 1.51 times 10 to the minus fifth seconds. Now remember, it has a half-life of 1.5 microseconds. So it has so that's 10 of its half-lives, right? Hot tip. It's not going to be 1 divided by 2 raised to the 10th that gets to the Earth. 
Why not? I calculate I calculated the time it's going to take as measured by Earth, but as measured by that muon, it's going to be a different time. Because the muon, you either can say that you have length contraction, that that 4,500 meters is much shorter, or time dilation, that this 1.51 times 10 to the minus fifth seconds is going to be um, a shorter time. So we have to calculate gamma, 1 over the square root of 1 minus 0.995 squared. So what is gamma? Ten. Okay, so since gamma is ten, then that means my delta time measured by Earth is equal to gamma delta time ot. So if I want to calculate the time measured in the muon's reference frame, that's one point five one times ten to the minus fifth seconds over ten is equal to one point five times ten to the minus six seconds. How many will remain? It's one half life, so half of them. Here's the two ways of looking at it as viewed from Earth. You have this large distance, but you're going to have time dilation. As viewed from the muon, it's stationary. The Earth is flying toward it, and the height of the mountain is only one-tenth as, as tall, 450 meters. Okay, we're obviously not going to do additional velocities until after the test.